very much, Bruce, and good evening, everyone. So I am going to talk this evening about um, the pet pig. So the learning objectives, hopefully, for this session will be to cover how to safely approach um, restrain, sedate, and anaesthetize the pig, which we probably have to do earlier in our examination of these species than we might with some of the other species that we more commonly deal with. We'll have a think about some of the common conditions that we encounter in the pet pig and think about some of the diagnostic and treatment options that we can use, thinking about the fact that these animals are regarded as food producing species. So the dreaded pet pig, and I think one of the things that can really trip us up is thinking about that they come in a variety of sizes. And initially, um, I was asked if I would talk about micro pigs. And micro pigs were sort of an entity that is um, sort of current, but we've moved, moved on from. There's a bit of a craze about five to seven years ago that everybody was purchasing these micro or teacup pigs and thinking that they were going to grow to about 20 or 25 kilograms. And what these micro and teacup pigs were, were crosses of relatively small Southeast Asian pigs, and the small, small being examples of that breed, and crossing them with some of our um, if you like, older world pigs, the Gloucester Old Spot, the Tamworth, etc. And sometimes they were lucky in, if you like, the production of runts or these litters of micro or teacup pigs. It, however, quickly became apparent that it wasn't very um, repeatable how small or large these pigs became. So some of these pigs that are sold and are still being sold as micro and teacup pigs might end up at 25 kilos or they might end up at 100 kilos, so very similar to the Southeast Asian pigs when they reach um, full size. So the whole idea of doing a talk on micro pigs is quite tricky because the micro pig, it really that whole entity is quite difficult for us to understand. So certainly the micro or teacup pigs are at the smaller end of the spectrum, but not. Um, but we don't always know what clients are going to end up with. We've then got the Southeast Asian pigs, the Cooney Coonies and the Potbelly pigs, which are coming in at about 100 to 120 kilograms when they are not obese. And then we've got the, um, if you like, the standard pigs, the Gloucester Old Spot, the Tamworth, and then some of the um, pigs that come out of commercial rearing units and which are land race pie train crosses, largely land race these days, which are going to come in somewhere between three to 400 kilos. They are extremely bright creatures, which is what causes us perhaps so many problems um, in terms of being able to examine them as veterinary patients. Um, they have varied temperaments. They are usually better with their owners, but not always. Um, and they can be extremely difficult with the owners and only get worse when you take the owner out of the scenario. Clients range from um, ex being extremely good at handling these animals to being fairly, um, perhaps even scared of, these, of these, uh, these pets that live with them. And handling facilities can range from extremely poor to non-existent to being absolutely excellent, and sometimes they are easier to handle at home, but it depends upon the setup. A proportion of them are certainly kept in small and substandard conditions, certainly in the area that I work in. There are often several that might live inside um, a semi-detached council house and have probably taken over that environment. Um, but the one thing that they are, because they're very bright, they certainly can easily be house trained. So they're sort of, if you like, the grumpy end of an extremely grumpy dog. But what we sometimes forget is that they are regarded as food producing animals. And because of that, we need to think of them as such. So pigs, whether they're pets or not, need to be tagged, tattooed, or have slap marks by the time they are 12 months of age. And my experience of that is pet pigs often aren't, and as vets, although it's not our responsibility, it certainly is something that we can point out to these clients that maybe do it because they don't know. There are a number of pharmacologic agents that are licensed in the pig and probably should be our first line when we're wanting to treat a range of conditions. 
and compared to some of the other species that I deal with, we can use oral drugs. They're monogastric species, they are omnivorous, just like dogs, um, and we can use these oral drugs as long as we use the cascade. So what do clients need to do? Well, this is the bit where it often falls down, and again, it helps if we have this baseline knowledge so that we can educate these clients. So all cloven-hoofed animals require an agricultural holding or county parish holding number. And once they've got a number, the owner can then contact the, HP, the HPHA, which has replaced the VLA, in terms of moving and registering livestock. So this is for all these cloven hoof creatures. Um, any client that has a cloven hoofed animal, including a pig, requires a holding register. They need to record the movement of all animals, and they also need to include movement required for provision of veterinary care. So if they bring the pig to your surgery, it needs to be recorded in their, um, in their diary, which is actually online for pigs. And they need to have a medicine record that as veterinary surgeons, we need to fill out. Pig movements are under more close control and scrutiny than other cloven hooved animals because there are much bigger risks of, um, particularly regarding the spread of foot and mouth disease because they often get mild signs. It often spreads. Pigs multiply this virus up very, very quickly, and so it will, um, will often spread because of pigs. Um, and as I've said, these movements are recorded electronically, and this includes even our micro and teacup pigs. Lots of people want to walk their pigs, which I think is great, particularly when we come on to talk later about the massive obesity problem that we have got in the pet pigs that we see. Um, but if they are taken off their registered premises, they need to have a license. And that license is only for a specific route that needs to be renewed annually. So you need to plot and decide what your daily walk's going to be, send it to the HPHA um, for approval. And this walk can't be near any livestock markets, which makes perfect sense, can't be near any commercial pig farms, but it also can't go past McDonald's or Burger King or any other food outlets that there are because of the risk of those animals eating meat um, that may well have come in from other countries um, that have got uh, diseases notifiable particularly, but have got diseases that that pig might contract or, more importantly, um, replicate and spread. So the other thing that we have, which again is much more stringent with pigs than with other uh, cloven-hooved animals, is that we, um, implore, we ha have to have movement restrictions when new animals enter the premises. And these movement restrictions are 20 days if they're pigs. And the same number of days is applied in terms of these standstill rules with the idea that we are able to prevent spread of notifiable diseases. So if that pig goes off the premises except on its walking route, which has been approved, then we have a 28-day um, standstill for, for that animal and for others, unless it's for veterinary treatment. We also need to um, record the drugs. So batch number being one of the most important things that maybe we're recording and maybe we're not recording for our other patients um, in quite the same detail. So for the practice, date of supply, name and address of recipient, how much drug they've had, what the batch number is, and we need to keep those records in the practice for five years. And the vet who administers the drug needs to fill in their medicine record book, including withdrawal periods, which obviously wouldn't apply to small animals. And what about non-licensed products? Because this is where um, it all becomes a bit difficult. So there are the people who say, if the product's not licensed for use in the pig for that condition, well, we shouldn't, we shouldn't use it at all. And then there's people, on the other hand, who say, well, it's a pet pig, therefore it's a free-for-all and we can use whatever we like. And actually, there's probably a happy medium in the middle. The Cascade was designed to help us and was certainly designed to help us in minority species. And in fact, there are only a handful of drugs in this random uh, legislation, which I'm sure none of you have read. It's very exciting if you need bedtime reading, which is called 37-2010. And in this um, 